Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day one of Connections Online 2022. My name is Maurice Fitzgerald, and I will be the uh, moderator of today's panel. I'm also better known as Mo, as you can see in my nickname down below. I'll be moderating today's panel where we will be discussing innovations in hobby wargaming. We have several fantastic designers with us today that will be talking about their designs as well as innovations in their games and other games that they've seen. First up, we have Bruce Maxwell. He is the designer of NATO The Cold War Goes Hot, as well as the upcoming Air and Armor. Both are by Compass Games. Then we have Fabrizio and Tony. They are from Thin Red Line Games, and they have the 1985 series and the C3 series, which they will be talking about. And finally, we have Mitch Land. He is the designer of the Next War series from GMT Games, and he's got uh, five games now in that series, so it's a great series. If you haven't checked it out, definitely do so. Uh, that will be uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion. Each one of them is going to do a presentation. And then after the presentations, we'll have the questions and answer after that. So we're going to start off first with Mitch and we will get him started. We'll take everyone else out and we'll let Mitch do his presentation. So Mitch, you ready to go? Yep, let's go. All righty. All right. Good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you happen to be tuning in from. Uh, Mitch Land, as Mo said, I... Uh, worked on the next war series for gmt as well as silver bayonet and uh <clears throat> gonna talk not necessarily about innovations in, in those series uh although we'll touch on them a little bit but just general innovations i've seen in hobby wargaming um over the years and, and some newer or more recent games i should say uh, although i do find it slightly ironic that three of the heaviest hex encounter war games are uh are designers or uh, represented in this panel. So that's going to be very interesting. Anyway, uh, so we're going to go behind the curtain and I figure out how to advance the slide. There we go. Um, so what, I just wanted to put this out here is what is Wargaming? Um, so, you know, I'm not going to read it to you. You can figure that out. Uh, but I think after we're done uh, talking and during the Q&A, we might want to revisit this uh, statement uh, of what what is Wargaming and, and why, why is that important uh, in terms of what I think I'm going to talk about. So we're just going to talk about some innovations I've seen just in printing, which seems very um, not very dramatic, but it, it's kind of important for, in the hobby wargaming space. Um, let's talk a little bit about mechanics, technology, and then some abstractions that I've seen coming in. So in terms of printing, so this is a screenshot from uh, the Next War Vietnam game, um, and it might be a little bit hard to see, but really what I wanted to point out is that over the years, printing has gotten much 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 better i mean even from mounted maps or paper maps but you can see along the top there are um lines and and uh movement connections and things like that you know 10 10 maybe 20 years ago that would probably wasn't possible even even maybe 10 years ago so printing has made great strides um in the in the ability to present information uh, on a on a particular map now obviously this is a, a very detailed hex encounter map as opposed to an area map or some uh point-to-point -point map or something like that. Um, but still, it, it's important. One of the things I wanted to point out is take a look at this counter sheet that we've laid out. You know, there's a lot of different colors that are butted up against each other. And some of them do have bleeds, but there are some like this orange and blue in the middle there that are right butt up against each other. 10 years ago, you couldn't do that because the colors would bleed over. Uh, so it's actually opened up a lot of opportunity for A, larger counters um, and just different better layouts of counters on, on a counter sheet so you can get more into a game and that's like i said it's not a super dramatic uh innovation in hobby wargaming from but, but from a, a developer or designer or producer it's very important in terms of the production value but even from a consumer it's good because you get more more out of that game uh and if anybody wants to ask me about any of these counters you can later <laughs> uh so one of the things i wanted to talk about you know one of the things that i've seen you know, it's been been a few years, but two two different instances. So here you're seeing uh, two different impl implementations of cyber warfare. And cyber warfare, obviously, is something that we all need to be aware of in a any kind of modern gaming format. The one on the left, that's the will be coming out in the upcoming Next War Supplement Three uh, for Cyber War. And I chose to go down a path of very mechanically not intense, but there's some die rolling involved and some choice choices to be made and you place markers and you make some die rolls against those and there's attack defense and defense values and things like that and you end up with these hack markers on the different various um, 
nodes on there. On the right, you see, and this, this might be familiar to some of you, you see um, the cards and tokens from the uh, Assassin's Mace game uh, from uh, those, or that, I guess it's a series of, of implementations. But anyway, they chose to go a card route, which, you know, from an innovation standpoint, while, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're a bunch of crunchy gamers. So, you know, that's why I like, and that's why I chose the, the model on the left. You can get a lot of value out of a card-based system where most of that information is just right on the card. You pull it randomly from a deck and you slap it down. That takes care of the randomization of a die roll, uh, the the way that it gets played and the way that it gets marked on the map. Those, those kinds of innovations make games sometimes uh, quicker uh, and much more easily accessible. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback I know I've gotten a lot is it, it's the next four series games are good, but they just take a long time to play. And that's true, right? Um, but a lot of it's because there's all this decision making space, you know, specifically in the kinds of mechanics on the left hand side, where you have to roll a die and you have to go to it, some kind of combat resolution or, or cyber team, you know, penetration, defense resolution, whatever you want to call it, and then figure that out. And that takes a chunk of time as opposed to I pull the card and I play it. Right. So I just took what was a five minute process down to a 10 second process or maybe five second process. So those kinds of innovations just speed up gameplay. And especially in a, in a professional space, that can be a, that can be a huge game changer because you don't often all have a lot of time to play big, large, complex games. So uh, I wanted to point out so one of the things that I've seen recently in using last hundred yards. Most of my games are going to be from GMT. It makes sense. Uh, but basically, it's the challenge of tried and true mechanisms. So, you know, Last 100 Yards is one of the latest entries into the, into the vast spectrum of tactical wargaming uh, that kind of turns that whole thing on its head. You know, most games, um, if you just made the list of here's the tactical squad level games, they pretty much all do the same thing. You have squads, you have rules around how they move. It's either I go, you go, or some kind of interactive sequence. And what, what Mike Denson did with Last 100 Yards and specifically was turn that all on its head. There's only one active player. The other guy is just reacting. And it's all about squad leadership as opposed to, you know, I've got the best weapon system and here's how those systems interact. And so it's a very unique system uh, that's a little bit more abstract from that standpoint, but works very well. Those kinds of innovations, I think, are what are, are very interesting in terms of um, putting a new spin on how games work, especially in, well, in, in this one, especially in the tactical space, uh, which is important to think about. One of the other innovations I've seen lately, and these are a little bit older games, um, but they're kind of the first, at least to the first ones that I experienced that use it, but they're app driven or app assisted. And so you'll have to, you know, when you play the game, you got to pull out your, where's my camera? You got to pull out your phone, right? And download the app and it, it, it either drives the game or helps you play the game or um, in some way, shape or manner, it's part of the game experience. So you have the board game in front of you and you have the app helping to drive the game. One of the downsides is if you don't support that app, the game will quickly, quickly become unplayable. You know, 10 years from now, is anybody really going to be supporting the first Martians? I don't know. Um, and that's one of the challenges that as publishers we have to figure out is because we are cardboard, paper and cardboard game developers and publishers first, not app developers. And so the app development and app main maintenance is a totally different uh, ball game. And you have to be able to commit to that and keep it up to date because as soon as iOS or Android or whatever changes an operating system, sometimes your app doesn't work. Well, now you got to go update it. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, I think it's I think it's got a lot of potential. Again, streamlining the game. It takes a lot of the, well, let me go figure out how all this works out and put it in the app so that I can just push something to you and, the, and it controls the game. So it speeds the game up. Um, the other thing I've seen, again, these are two games from GMT, Nevsky and Atlantic Chase, is a level of abstraction um, that we're seeing coming out of games. And, and you know, the the one on the left, the Levian campaign series, Nevsky from Boko, has exploded. I mean, I don't, I can't even remember how many titles are, uh, in the works uh, on that one, but it's it's much more of an abstract game. Focuses on logistics, um, strangely enough, and uh, granted in medieval ish times, uh, but still, it's it's a much more abstract. Not no no hexes. You know there are counters, uh, but they're you don't really move them around on the map. You move little boxes around 
or blocks around. Uh, and then Atlantic Chase, while there are hexes, you don't really put stuff on the map. You have these, you know, lines, I forget what they're called now, but um, that you're trying to track down and there's a whole host of rules around around how that works. And the, the level of abstraction that makes the game more approachable, I think, is what we're seeing more and more and more of coming out of game developers, not just GMT, other, other game companies are doing it too, right? But it's getting the ability to get players into the game uh, in, or into games, I should say, into war games and giving them concepts and, and uh, conceptual ideas and things that they can use to approach that. And then maybe, you know, someday down the road, they actually play a next war style game or, or you know, uh, C3 or uh, Air and Armor, which I'm looking forward to. But, uh, you know, this is these, they're good ways to get people into the hobby. And that's something we, as a hobby war gamer, we're always looking to do is how do we get uh, new gamers to, into the hobby and approaching? Because when you put something like Next War down and you say, well, move your brigade from this hex to this hex, the first question you get is, what's a brigade? Well, it's that little X with this. Yeah, I don't know what that means, right? They don't, people don't understand what NATO symbology is. And so things like this help with that um, to give them that base level of knowledge once they once they get to that war. Uh, so that's why I put this at the beginning and at the end is, uh, you know, challenging what does really a war game look like? And does it have to have hexes and counters and a CRT and things like that? And from the hobby wargaming standpoint, I think that definition is certainly migrating um, or have, has migrated maybe, but it's more about this. It's a, it's a, are you making decisions to affect the outcome of a game, right? Uh, specifically around conflict. So one of the, one of the things to think about and, and talk about, I think. And so I think I'll stop there and let Mo have it back. Thanks very much, Mitch. I really appreciate that. That was great. And you got a lot of uh, ideas there for questions at the end, which we're going to remind everybody that questions and answers will be at the end. So if you have any questions about uh, Mitch's games or any of the concepts he's talked about here, save them to the end if you could, please. So we're going to take Mitch out and we're going to bring in Fabrizio and Tony. And whoops, I got the wrong one. There we go. There we go. And we're going to have... Fab and Tony talk about the 1985 and the C3 series. If you're not familiar with them, you can go to trlgames.com and check them out, and I'll let them take it away. Okay. So I'm Fabrizio Vianello from uh, Thin Redline Games. We are uh, quite a new publisher for, uh, for War Games. We started something like five uh, years ago, and we have uh, basically two main series uh, of game. One is... Uh, 1985, that is a more strategic series, and the second series is a C3 series, that is um, more at an operational level, and uh, uh, it's probably the, the series that has a more innovative uh, uh, rules uh, uh, between the between the two, and uh, so for the the, the, free C, the C3 series. Uh, as uh, an operational level at a battalion uh, regiment uh, uh, units with the one turn that is only three hours and uh, five kilometers per, per hex. Um, the, the series will be on five modules and uh, at the moment we have already developed uh, and uh, published two of these modules. The first one is less than 60 miles that covers the uh, U.S. Fifth Corps uh, our, our responsibility uh, during a, a hypothetical World War III in Central Europe in 1985. And the second module is the Ducks of War that covers the uh, British Army of the Rhine, our, our responsibility uh, again in 1985 during uh, World War III. And, uh, now it's up to Tony to present himself. <laughs> well, hi, good morning, everybody, uh, or afternoon or evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Um, I am probably slightly the odd one out here. I have not been doing this professionally very long at all. I was a serving officer in the British Army for nigh on 40 years. 
across a whole panel of things. But I have wargamed and I have written rules and I have run professional war games or developments within within the services over the whole of that time period. Um, I came into Thin Red Lines uh, uh, to help out on the 1985 series. And uh, well, though we're not going to discuss that greatly here, I'll just give you a nod back. In Connections uh, 21 last year, we talked a great deal about 1985. You can see it there. But where we did the innovation in that um, and how Fabrizio has been innovating and changing the basis of, I think, uh, Hex and Counter War Games is that 1985 started out as a rewrite of a 1977 classic, which was bizarrely also called The Next War. Um, but that Next War, a massive game, was designed to represent a Warsaw Pact attack on NATO in the 1970s. Fabrizio rewrote it, and we ended up with a standard hex encounter tank and air slugfest in Western Germany. So what have we done since then? Well, this last year has seen us publish the final one in the trilogy, which takes us all the way out to a hiatus in the Iran-Iraq war in the, our version of 1985. And we have innovated a way to bring in the whole of um, strategic movement, uh, redeployment, logistics, etc., in a methodology that varies from the use of cards to the use of non-hex, offline, uh, off-map um, charting to allow what was a tank and air slugfest to become a strategic stroke operational level game where you as the player end up making the kind of decisions that we that we were originally paying four and five star generals to do. So that's me, that's what we did in those terms. As far as what we're doing in C3, which is dropping down a level um, in terms of operational capability to what used to be called the core level or operational level, um, I'll let uh, Fabrizio take it back and we will look at some of the innovations over the various parts that we've been doing over the last year or two. Fabrizio. Okay, so um, the C3 series uh, um, is uh, heavily focused uh, on the command, uh, control and communication uh, uh, problems, uh, its constraints uh, and uh, its effects. So it's uh, quite different from uh, most uh, commercial war games uh, because uh, uh, you, you really have to plan uh, your actions and uh, uh, your planning is not uh, an immediate effect uh, on the on the uh, on the battlefield and uh, for example the, the first uh, uh, probably most important part uh, of the game uh, is the, 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 the representation of the C3 uh, concept because uh, every unit uh, needs uh, uh, some order and uh, that order will bring the unit to deploy on the battlefield in a certain way. So uh, your units will not be able, for example, to attack and to defend at the same time at their best. Uh, it will depend by by the orders you gave your, to, to your units, if they're, they're, they're good uh, in uh, defending against an enemy at assault, uh, or if they're good uh, to uh, attack uh, the enemy. There are also some uh, um, jack of all trades, uh, uh, of all trades uh, um, deployment, that is a so called tactical deployment, where a unit will be. Um, quite decently able to move, we will be able to attack most most decent, in a decent manner, and we'll be able to defend too. But if you really want to use them at their maximum level, you have to give specific orders. This order will, will take time, and the time needed by the headquarters to conceive, to write, uh, and to transmit the orders along the chain of command. And uh, after that, uh, when the, the orders finally arrive uh, at the maneuver elements, the maneuver elements will, uh, will need additional time 
to actually deploy on the battlefield according to the, to the orders received. Uh, all this will uh, bring uh, uh, also the work, workload on the command staff. So your command staff will not be able to do everything at the same time. Uh, if it's, uh, for example, writing down the order for a whole division to, to change uh, his deployment from uh, defense to assault, uh, there will be not too much time and too many uh, human resources to use uh, uh, available to for 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 doing uh, or for planning other things. And finally, another aspect that is taken into account is that uh, any problem uh, along the chain of command uh, impose uh, imposes uh, an additional delay uh, for the orders. So, for example, if uh, one of the headquarters along the chain of command has been uh, uh, bombarded by enemy artillery or uh, has uh, uh, incurred in, in losses, uh, there will be an additional delay. So making uh, uh, the, the whole process uh, uh, even slower. Up to a point that if, uh, if for example, a, a, an important quarter has been completely eliminated by an enemy bombardment or enemy attack, uh, the, the chain of command will be broken and we uh, actually not be able to send out uh, and to issue current orders until, uh, until the, 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 the chain of command is, has been uh, uh, actually restored. And uh, I think that that's it more or less for uh, the chain of command. And now up to Tony again for the tactical movements. So how do you innovate in movement? It's pretty, you know, there are simply historically in war games in hobby war games there have been one of two methodologies it's either people get obsessed by you know my tank or this type of tank an m1 tank can do 47.35 miles an hour when crossing the road or whatever or it goes down and says track vehicles do you know move at this rate and wheel vehicles move at that rate and foot soldiers move at that rate and we'll knock a bit off if they're going cross country that sort of thing um we look at it slightly differently and as you can see very simply from the graphic that's in front of you there we essentially decided that you know we would do what the militaries do and that we would take there are essentially three methods of, of moving column mode which we assume moves at 20 to 30 k's an hour day or not k's in the hour tactical mode which is essentially using the best methodology to move across the ground and deployed mode which is exactly as it says and then for each of the hexes we then apply what the engineers would do for real which is that you end up with a go or a no-go terrain and that then affects there and so you end up with you being able to look at how far uh, or what kind of posture do you have to put your force in if you want it to rapidly advance over x type of terrain and take all the consequential penalties for choosing the wrong one or the consequential benefits for choosing the right one so there we go very different from just saying i've got 15 movement points and i'll take off two for here and one for there it's a bit more nuanced than that very chill Okay, uh, the next point of innovation in the system is probably the uh, retrograde operations and the disengagement system. Uh, in most uh, commercial war games, uh, you have, uh, for example, the uh, retreat result for, for the defender. And uh, at that point, the, the, the defender is forced or has the possibility to retreat. Uh, in uh, C3, there is no uh, retreat uh, result. Uh, the defender can may choose to retreat uh, during uh, any combat, but the problem is that the retreat is not uh, automatic or assured. Uh, so the, the defender has to try to disengage actually from the combat. And uh, uh, disengaging, uh, as probably many of you know, uh, it's a uh, actually a quite a risky uh, operation. Uh, so it must be prepared beforehand. Your unit must be placed in a terrain that will allow to retreat uh, if, uh, if needed. 
uh, will need uh, deployment on the ground uh, that uh, uh, will facilitate uh, retrograde operation or, and uh, or a disengagement. Uh, the support from uh, friendly units uh, can uh, also help in uh, retreating from uh, uh, from a combat. Uh, recent uh, engagement uh, or bombardment uh, can uh, hamper or, dis or disrupt the, the disengagement and so on. There are several factors that are uh, uh, considered and uh, that must be taken into account uh, for a successful disengagement. Uh, in the end, uh, if, a, if a disengagement is successful, the defender will be able to uh, reduce the, any losses uh, incurred uh, uh, in combat. And on the other side, if uh, the, the, the disengagement is not successful, the, the losses could, uh, could, actually, could actually increase uh, or, or the disengagement could fail at all and the, the defender will be uh, forced to stay in place and keep uh, and take uh, additional punishment uh, from, from the attacker. Uh, so the disengagement uh, and uh, can and the retreat uh, it's a quite a, a complex and a risky matter uh, as i said and i think that uh, the c3 series is quite good in uh, representing this because you cannot simply decide to retreat uh, at, uh, at the last minute uh, as an afterthought uh, you really have to plan uh, for uh, uh, your units to prepare the channels of retreat uh, to prepare uh, uh, artillery and their support uh, for helping uh, disengagement uh, to prepare uh, your uh, support from other units uh, that could uh, uh, could uh, help the retreating unit uh, or uh, substitute the retreating unit in the front line and so on there are a lot a lot of aspects to, to take into account and now to Tony again for combat uncertainty. And as you just heard Fabrizio say, one of the things that we wanted to put back in to game to the degree of combat uncertainty, anybody who has played uh, hobby war games over the years says that some stage in their life played an opponent who sits there and takes forever to do one turn. And the reason he sits there and takes forever is he sat down calculating the exact uh numbers required to do course of action a or if i do course of action b i'll need to throw a you know this that and the other and that is a, such and such a percentage chance and so on and so forth and it goes on um the real world is not like that things go wrong the minutiae of life go wrong and we wanted to make sure that that was included and more than just the random throw of one dice saying that so we have run throws of a number of dice die. And in essence, you can never, no matter with the best will in the world, you can never guarantee the exact effect of your artillery or your air. Will you get EW? Will it work? Does it function? You can try and improve it, but you can never be certain. And really introducing uncertainty across the board in areas that have always been certain uh, in standard war games such as you know the results of crts um does give uh, certainly we have found with our customers a completely different feel to the game and one which they appear to be to be happy with um so that's us really that's combat uncertainty so back to far okay so the next point is uh, the engineer support uh, and uh, river crossing. Uh, in most commercial war games, not in every, but in most of them, uh, when a, a unit has to cross a river, it's quite a simple matter. You just pay an extra movement cost to, to cross the river, and um, that's it, uh, uh, end of the problem. Uh, of course, um, uh, reality is, uh, is quite different. Uh, in, uh, in the C3 Frisian system, we have uh, basically uh, four uh, different kind of types uh, of uh, uh, river crossing. 
and uh, most of them requires uh, require uh, engineer support require a, a common staff uh, a workload uh, to, for uh, to plan them to send in the engineers uh, and to plan the, 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 the execution of a river crossing um, and uh, so you you have to decide in advance uh, even for river, river crossing you have to decide in advance what kind, which kind of uh, uh, river crossing you are going to, to execute and you have to plan in advance uh, your resources in order to actually execute it. Uh, basically, the, the fourth kind of river crossing that we uh, are represented are uh, hasty crossing, hasty crossing that is, uh, can be executed by any amphibious unit uh, using uh, only the, the, in the embedded engineers uh, and the, the equipment, uh, uh, its own equipment, the equipment on hand uh, uh, with the unit. And it's, of course, quite fast. Uh, but, uh, uh, of course, if, if you are going to have an opposed ST uh, river crossing, it's also quite dangerous. Uh, the second method is uh, deliberate crossing, where uh, you're actually going to use uh, some... Uh, engineer support so the engineers must be uh, uh, must be arrive in place uh, the, the, the quarter must uh, uh, commit the engineers to, to the crossing and so on so it uh, requires more resources uh, the third kind of uh, um, of crossing is by using uh, ribbon bridges uh, ribbon bridges uh, will uh, We'll need uh, again uh, engineer support, and uh, we'll need a common staff uh, uh, workload time from the from the common staff to plan them, and uh, we'll also need uh, time for the engineer to actually uh, assemble the, the ribbon bridges. Uh, moreover, the ribbon bridge a ribbon bridge uh, is a needs uh, a, practically a constant uh, uh, engineer presence in order to 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 be kept uh, operational so uh, it's quite fast to, to assemble but uh, after that uh, you need to keep uh, your uh, your precious uh, engineering resources busy on site uh, keeping the ribbon bridge uh, working and the last kind, uh, uh, last type of of crossing is with the panel bridges. Uh, with the panel bridge, uh, again, you need a uh, uh, common staff uh, for planning uh, and engineer support. Will take more time than a ribbon bridge uh, to be uh, to be assembled. But uh, on the positive side, uh, once uh, once it has been assembled. Uh, it will need uh, only a minimum, uh, minimal uh, engineer maintenance. So uh, your engineer resources will be able to 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 be can be used uh, somewhere else for uh, for uh, for that. Uh, so the, these are the, the, the four types. Of, moreover, and opposed uh, some types, some types of uh, uh, river crossing the hasty and the deliberate crossing, both have a, a, a risk of uh, uh, accidents. Uh, the, 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 the bottom of a river can be uh, rocky or murky. The uh, amphibious equipment can be called malfunc malfunction. So there are a lot of stuff that can actually could go wrong. Could go wrong. And uh, so uh, a unit that trying a hasty or deliberate river crossing incurs the possibility of attrition uh, just for for trying it uh, because of some of its equipment where we go to the basically to the bottom of the river and that's it and now up to tony again no it's up to me again for for the sigint and uh, the detection of enemy position this is another very interesting uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, feature of the C3 series. 
the signal intelligence uh, and the detection of enemy position. Uh, basically, the, uh, the uh, effectiveness of uh, effectiveness of artillery, missile, and air strikes depends uh, by how precisely the, the enemy position can be uh, pinpointed uh, on a map on the coordinates. And um, the, the system takes into account a, a series of factors to, uh, to decide how good the, the, the position of the enemy has been pinpointed. These factors are basically the, the distance from friendly units, uh, the ground reconnaissance, uh, air reconnaissance, and uh, uh, last but not least, the signal intelligence. Uh, that is, for example, when uh, uh, that is acquired when uh, when uh, a, an enemy quarter, for example, starts uh, uh, issuing uh, orders, so its radio traffic uh, uh, is going to increase. This, of course, uh, is if the headquarter has not uh, had, uh, had not the time to prepare a cable connection. Uh, and so avoiding uh, to avoid the, uh, the increase in radio traffic. But in a quarter that is moving uh, is, a, uh, is a bound to use uh, its uh, radio equipment to transmit orders uh, to communicate with, uh, with its units. And so it's, uh, uh, it will uh, emit uh, uh, an enormous quantity of uh, signal intelligence that can be used by the enemy to, to detect uh, the, the exact, its exact position. So artillery and uh, airstrikes uh, heavily depends uh, by the, 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 the detection level of uh, the enemy that they are going to, to hit. And that's a very, very important part uh, of the game. And now, Tony. <laughs> so finally to finish this off you will rarely find in war games or in hobby war games that purport to talk about nato and the warsaw pact uh, national characteristics other than occasionally somebody will make a call that these people were perhaps slightly more professional than the others or these people were slightly different from the others and there is something like a Carter rating, you know, a, a plus one on a dice if you belong to a professional army like the Canadians or the Brits or somebody, and perhaps an, an even throw if you're deemed to be the best of the of the conscript armies at the time, for example, the Bundeswehr in the 1980s, or some such like that. The thing that struck me when I came in is that, and having worked in NATO a lot for real over the time period and afterwards actually first time i went to nato is in the late 1980s and the last time i worked in there was in the mid 2000s is that it is not a homogenous element if there are differences there is no such thing as nato doctrine there are some overarching principles but they're interpreted differently by the United States, by the United Kingdom, by the Germans, by the Dutch, by the bum, 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 bum. And so that you will see in our games, in the C3 series, that as you play the NATO, it become, you have to play each of the nationalities within the game slightly differently to play to their strengths or their weaknesses um if you're attacking them and you see some of them lifted up up there um, it allows diff differing nations are allowed differing uh, uh increases so the reality of west germany is that they can react faster their order system is their uda loop if you like is pretty quick because of our tactic the warsaw pact has the ability to assault from the line of march but it does so at various costs that you have to understand both as a Warsaw Pact player, but also as a NATO player, and so on and so forth for the others. And that list will get longer as we go through the rest of the games and develop them and they bring them out and publish them and whether we start to include, you know, Danes and Dutchmen and Frenchmen and, and so on and so forth. 
So that's really where we went with natural characteristics. And if we just then quickly round up the whole thing and put a conclusion on this, we've listed a lot of things that make this sound incredibly complicated, much more like a simulation than a game. But the real innovation, I think, is here is that it is a game. It is playable as a game. It is playable as a game with one person playing. You do not need a whole staff to support you. You can play it relatively rapidly once you know and understand the rules and understand the concepts. It's got a long learning curve, but it's a hobby war game. And so for playability is the key to this. And that is what we have endeavored to bring in with this system and with the 1985 system. And I think that's probably us as far as introductions are concerned. So let's hand back to Mo. All righty. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you guys. It was a great presentation. And we already have uh, some questions in the Discord that we will be uh, talking about when we hit the Q&A segment after Bruce is done. Bruce, do you have any uh, slides or screens you'd like to share? I do. So let me share my uh, my first file here. Okay. Right. And I think it's going to be easiest if I just share my desktop. Sure. So let's go with that. And all right. Can you see my screen? I do not see anything yet. Oh, there we go. All righty. That so works. Should be all set. All right. I'll hand it over to you, Bruce. Um. So. Well, my understanding is that this audience is largely an audience out of the uh, professional military arms and that your interest in wargaming and particularly in attending this convention is how you might bring some ideas coming out of the civilian economy, the professional military simulations, that are designed to uh, educate and practice uh, professional officers in their trade. And so I'm going to focus on a couple of things that I believe are innovations that solve problems that military war game designers face, because in many regards, you face many of the same problems that we face. So. I'm going to cherry pick just a couple of things from my designs that I think might be helpful. So let's begin um, with the classic problem of something called a zone of control. Um, the zone of control came out of early times, and the basic concept was that a unit uh, occupied not only the central hex in which it was located, but either occupied or projected firepower into the six adjacent hexes. That was one of the most fundamental innovations in the early days of wargaming. It has, however, over the years created lots of problems. Zones of control can be rigid, which means that you cannot move through them. They can be locking, which means once you enter them, you cannot exit them except through combat or they can be porous, meaning that you can, in fact, move through them, usually at a much reduced rate. In is rigid ZOCs, where you cannot move from one ZOC to another, the defending player has a huge incentive to set up a defense line exactly as I have shown here. The enemy cannot go through these open areas between my super stacks, and I have stacked all of my units two to three hexes apart in the very best terrain, 
and you are going to have to dig me out of that very best terrain, attacking all of my forces in that area in order to penetrate my line. The fact that this hex here, um, which in this particular game, which is NATO, each hex is 15 miles. The fact that this 15 miles is only covered by artillery is irrelevant. My ZOCs are locking and you cannot break through this 15 mile gap in my line. You're going to have to dig me out of this uh, city of Oldenburg or dig me out of this forest here. This is perfectly good deployment for a war gamer, but it is a terrible deployment from the perspective of teaching anybody anything about how to hold a line in the real world, because if you gave the Soviets a 15 mile gap in your lines, you can bet that before you'd finish frying your breakfast bacon, miles in your rear. So when I set out to design this game, I wanted to solve this problem because it really bothered me. So the requirement was that I was going to force players to defend every single hex in the line because it was absurd to think that NATO would have left 15 to 30 mile gaps in their line covered only by artillery and attack helicopters. So the rule system required ZOCs to be extremely porous so that I could penalize a player who left a 15 mile gap in his line and therefore the NATO player is now required to defend his whole line, not by a rule, but by the fear that the enemy is going to penetrate the line. That puts the NATO player in the position of defending like this, where he is holding every hex so that the enemy doesn't get a free breakthrough. But this creates an entirely different problem, which is now the enemy during his turn is going to be able to concentrate all of his forces on one hex and achieve overwhelming odds, whilst the rest of my units essentially do nothing during that particular turn. So I needed to solve the problem that people do hold continuous lines, but they need to be able to reinforce a line where it is threatened. And so what I introduced was which is a dynamic defender function during the attacker's turn. And so the concept is that a unit that is not, <coughs> <coughs> my apologies, I'm recovering from a cold, a unit that is not the last unit in the hex has the ability to react into an adjacent hex just before a combat is executed so that the line will bunch up where an attack is delivered and I'm not penalized for covering my whole line. So this unit here in cannot react because it would be the last unit in the hex, but this Dutch unit up here with the two arrows could react either north or south because it is not the only unit in that hex. Same for this West German Panzer unit, and same for either of these two armor brigades, which could react to reinforce an adjacent hex if it is threatened. Now, the, that is a viable deployment in this game system for NATO, but by putting my reserves up on the front line, I have also stacked them meaning that an enemy air strikes into that hex are going to catch both of those units. So in the rules, players who play the game after a while and suffer from the lash of enemy air power learn to play it like this, where they actually hold reserves. Those reserves then react in to the frontline hexes, meaning that an enemy airstrike now has to choose between hitting a frontline unit or hitting a reserve, but cannot hit both. And so this system with a very simple rule <clears throat> encourages the two opponents to begin to develop a front line and a set of reserves 
that actually starts to look the way real world commanders would deploy. And so, example of a designer facing a problem set and coming up with a game system that encourages players to build um, a defensive line or to construct an attack, whatever the problem set is, in a way that is realistic with a few simple rules. All right, I'm going to move on from, from the topic of reaction. Um, another thing in NATO that I rather liked was this. So here is a conventional battle. Um, we have uh, three hexes adjacent to this battle marker, and they are going to attack. There will be a determination of what the attack odds are, a die roll in the CRT, and the result. And that's a conventional attack. But one of the things that we all know is that the objective of any commander is to outflank his opponent, and if possible, pocket him and pound him. So I wanted to build a game system that rewarded players for achieving that outcome. And so I created a concept called a flanking attack. If a unit is surrounded by enemy zones of control, but is still adjacent to a friendly unit, he is flanked. So here, the Soviets have been able to get far enough into NATO's rear <coughs> that they are now flanking this battlefield and they are going to get a column shift in their favor. And then finally, they've actually surrounded that enemy unit and it is not adjacent to another friendly unit. Then they get something termed a concentric attack and that gives them two column shifts. But this deeply rewards a player who stages his attack in a way that allows one attack to punch a hole in the enemy's line and outflank the target of the next attack. And also it encourages things like vertical envelopment by airborne troops to cut off somebody's line of retreat and actually have that reflected in the combat odds of the attack. So this is just uh, an example of, a small example, of trying to reward a player for behavior that we want them to miss. All right, so I will uh, move off of NATO, and I'm now going to move to my second design, which is air and armor. Okay, so air and armor, like NATO, is set in West Germany in the um, mid-1980s. However, uh, unlike NATO, where each hex is 15 miles, in air and armor, each X is one mile, and therefore it is a much more tactical game. Hey, Bruce, I just want to jump in for one second. We're not seeing the Please. slides advance. Oops. You mean n none of the slides that I just showed advance? The, the last we saw was the battle with the flanking attack. Okay. Um, so you're not currently seeing my screen. All right, I'm I do stop. see a screen. Here we go. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to reshare. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get this to go where I need to be. Gremlins always got to get in the way, right? <laughs> but of course. All right. All right, so that's not the right screen. Your browser has blocked your screen. That's very strange. Okay. <clears throat> oh, he dropped out for a second. So we'll just have to wait for Bruce to reconnect. He must have had some issues with his uh internet he does have uh some internet issues i know that but while we're waiting for him to join us back uh, if you have any questions make sure that you are saving them or you can actually post them in here as well and we will get to them at the uh, end when we get to the q a segment 
And we'll give Bruce a couple minutes here to see if he can get back. If not, we will uh, proceed on to the Q&A and at least get started on that. But he is back, so that's good. Because otherwise, I was going to say we'll start with Q&A, and then when Bruce gets his internet sorted, we'll get him back on and let him finish his presentation. Yeah, sorry about that. No, that happens. Let's see if I can find the right interface here. All right, I'm going to share my entire screen, and I'm going to hope that yeah. this works this time. All right, can, we go. can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, um, there we go. I will Take go ahead and remove myself, and it's all back to you. Moment. Thank you for letting me know. So um, as I was saying, uh, Aaron Armour is set in the 1980s as well, but at the um, tactical level so that each hex is one mile across, no, 50 miles across. So every war game is a simulation and it is an abstraction. And so the designer has got to determine what he is going to focus on. So for example, in Tony and Fabrizio's game, they have focused very much on C3I. And so the game is set uh, around the challenges that a commander faces in planning his operations. Um, and essentially outwitting his opponent by thinking at the right place at the right time in the right posture um, several turns down the road, therefore uh, wrong-footing his opponent. And that becomes the focus of the simulation. The problem set that I set out to solve is that most war games give players an absolutely godlike view of the battlefield. They can see exactly where their opponent's units are and generally have a pretty good idea of what they are capable of. I wanted to defeat this because I would put it to you that the job of a commanding officer is to manage chaos. War is nothing if not chaotic and teaching people how to perfect their operations in a command intelligence and perfect control gives them a very, very artificial sense of their ability to command events on a real battlefield. Um, in a real battlefield, everything is chaos. And you're trying to manage that chaos. If we are going to train officers, they have to be trained as close as possible to the stress of real battle. And you eliminate a great deal of that stress when you can show him exactly where his opponents are. So at least in the civilian wargaming world, that absence of any kind of a double blind, that inability to create the fog of war is a, a challenge for producing. So in Aaron Armour, that was what I chose to focus on, was the fog of war. And I did it in two layers, and I'm going to demonstrate this now. So layer one, is something called open mode in which I know where my own units are, but I do not know where the enemy's units are. Now, as you can see here, yes, I know where the enemy's units are. I am the Soviet player. I am staring at an array of US units that are deployed. I know exactly where those units are. What do you mean fog of war? Well, the game system plays what the Russians love to call Maskarovka with you. So yes, I do know, unfortunately, I don't know what they are. So every unit counter here is paired with a step. So a classic step is a reinforced company. And so NATO can stack up to a battalion in a hex. So this, Bradley unit here um, might be a dummy. It could contain one company, or it could contain an entire battalion. I don't know, as the Soviet player, what marker is underneath that. Now, there is a marker, but only the NATO player knows what it is. I don't. And the only way I'm going to find out what's underneath that unit is either to move into contact with it or to use my, my reconnaissance assets 
to attempt to see it. But if that unit was a dummy, I'm launching an attack on that position and there isn't anybody there. Meaning, yes, I can see exactly where my opponent's units are, but I have absolutely no idea where his real force is deployed. So I do in this uh, setup, however, have the ability to control my own forces. So in this game, a Soviet regiment has three unit counters and it's got no and so when I enter this unit, I can determine what it looks like. So I may say, okay, I'm going to put one company in the first unit. I'm going to make the second unit a dummy. And I'm going to put virtually all of the regiment in the third unit. And so I might launch my attack down this road <coughs> by moving my one unit adjacent to the enemy so that I can determine what he is. I might move my dummy out here, threatening to outflank that position, but I've moved here because my plan is actually to go hit him through the forest. And I'm hoping to mislead my opponent into thinking that my main force is over here when in fact it's not. So um, this, this creates an incredible sense of hidden, um, essentially the fog of war, and this hidden unit system means that I have to take a lot of risks and operate in an environment of uncertainty, and it also gives me the ability to create feints, deceptions, traps, and ambushes which are virtually impossible to do in a war game where you have a godlike sense of control. All right, so, which is called open mode. However, there is a second layer of this game, which is called hidden mode. And in hidden mode, not only do I not know where the enemy's forces are located, but I'm not entirely sure of where my own forces are located. Now, you might say, well, wait a second, but I mean, I do know where my own forces are located. Well, not really. As anybody who has commanded real world operations knows, units report that they are in places that they are not. Units fail to report. Units get lost. Units get jammed. Knowing where your own forces are at any one particular point in time is almost as challenging as knowing where your are. And just to highlight that problem, I want to just regale you with the fact that the first known use of the term fog of war appeared in a book called, unsurprisingly, The Fog of War, which was written by a British colonel in 1896. His name was Sir Lonsdale Augustus Hale. And here was the primary quote that everybody has used since that book. He described the fog of war as, quote, the state of ignorance in which commanders frequently find themselves as regards the real strength and position, not only of their foes, and so in hidden mode, I don't know where my own units are. So let's, let's do this again for a second. So I'm now going to consider an attack on this position here. I'm going to enter my units, but they don't have step markers. Uh, in hidden mode, I'm not the one who makes that determination. So we will remove these markers and we will simply say that my regiment enters and it's got the three counters that I start with. So these three counters are now going to be coming in off map. And so I move my first counter here and I am now going to roll on uh, a table which um, correlates the um, type of unit that is moving with the type of operation that they are performing. And so there would be a die roll on that table and I might determine that this particular unit has now showed up with two companies. And then I might move my second unit in here 
and it might turn out to be a dummy, which means that it is instantly removed, and so that unit wasn't real. And then I may say, okay, I'll move my third unit in here, and I may roll fairly well, and so I've got four companies in here. Well, this was a full-strength regiment. It had nine reinforced companies. Six of them have actually made it into this battle. The other three companies are lost. They are somewhere else. And so this attack would then be resolved. If we didn't know what the defender was, the defender would also make a roll to see what he had here. And so both sides are doing their best to get their forces where they need them. But there is no guarantee that all the forces are going to be in the right place at the right time. It is chaotic. Players report that it is quite stressful to play the game in hidden mode because you really aren't in control. But as a simulation of the true command environment and as a test of an office, this is a far more realistic simulation than your typical at least commercial war game, in which a player has a godlike control over his forces and his intelligence on his enemy forces. So I'll stop there, but that is one innovation that I think um, put players in a much more realistic battlefield situation than a conventional war game. Mo, back to you. I'm going to be bringing everyone back into the stream being that all the presentations are done. So thank you all for the presentations today, number one. Y'all did a great job. I really appreciate that. And I know people in the audience do as well. So what we're going to do is now we're going to transition to the Q&A segment. So if you have any questions, make sure you post them in the YouTube chat and we will put them up on screen for everyone to discuss. And uh, we will also be you know, talking about things amongst ourselves. One of the things I wanted to hit on first was, uh, Mitch, in your presentation, you talked about uh, app-assisted games and the innovations there, I think, are great. However, you did bring up one of my pet peeves with those, which is uh, they have to have support or be open source code at the end of the developer's life cycle. So that way they can continue on because I can pull out a game from 1958, an original copy of Tactics, and play it today the same way you could play back then. However, any of the games are app assisted in 50 years, you may not be able to play that unless it's open source code and get support from the community. Yeah. Well, and in 50 years, you're probably still not going to be able to play it, but you know, yeah. that, that's one of the interesting conundrums, I think. So I, if it's open source though, you could probably reverse engineer it and, and do something else with it. Um, but I think from a, a, an immediate standpoint, yes, it's very neat and yes, it can be very helpful, but you need to consider the long-term ramifications and what that might mean from a, from a publishing standpoint of how long do I want to support this? And do I end up, Hey, you know what? We're done. Here's the, here's the source. If somebody wants to go create a bunch of tables or something, or charts that you can roll on to, to recreate what actually the app was doing. Here you go. Here's how it works. Right? Very true. And uh, we do have one uh, question that came in earlier from Timothy Smith saying, I've heard Scuttlebutt that the five games in the series are being considered for reprint. They all sold out amazingly quickly. And I believe he was talking about the, uh, C3 games as well as the 1985 games. So you guys have any comments about that, Fabrizio and Tony? <laughs> Fabrizio? Considered for a print. <laughs> <laughs> Five games, all, all of them. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, they sold out amazingly quickly, and that's also because we, we really have uh, usually very small print runs. Under under one thousand, um, so uh, and uh, the, the real problem for reprinting is that we we are a really really small publishing company. Uh, basically, uh, the, the whole publishing company is present right now at this uh, at this conference, <laughs> so, and I mean everybody. Uh, the, the people uh, uh, make, uh, making the boxes uh, and uh, uh, making the, the, the deliveries, it's uh, here too. So, <laughs> so uh, a reprint, uh, it's, uh, it's something that takes uh, uh, a considerable chunk of our already limited resources. 
and uh, as uh, as I've, uh, I've written on our uh, site, uh, having fun is also very important for for us, and reprinting is actually usually not much fun. So, <laughs> so we are, uh, we we try not to avoid them, but uh, we we are doing them uh, with. Uh, Slower than, uh, than than most of the other publishers, when the, the by popular demand uh, or by by threats, uh, they they convince us to to actually make a print. The, the the next the next publishing actually will be a reprint. It is the reprint of uh, uh, mid 1985 uh, Deadly Northern Lights. Mm-hmm. It is the, the second module of a 1985 series. Uh, uh, that covers the the war uh, in uh, the northern Europe. Okay. And uh, after that, it could be that uh, we have uh, more reprints uh, with uh, less than sixty miles. But we'll see. Excellent. Sorry for that. No, 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 no. That was great information. We have a question from Pratima Wira, and I apologize if I butcher anyone's names. That is not intentional. Uh, great presentation. My question: Have there been innovations that aren't directly related to battle realism? For example, innovations on playability, like how to make it, that that's a great thing that I know you all have to deal with as far as separating the realism and simulation from gaming and, you know, make it where it's more of game than it is a hardcore simulation. So, Bruce, why don't you handle that one first? Bruce, can you hear me? Hey, sorry about that. <laughs> I was like, he's just yeah, like, how the hell are you, Mo? You know how... Uh, um, but yeah, playability. Um, so one thing that I have seen a great deal of attention being paid to by publishers is this concept of player aids. And so, um, you know, in the old days, you would have a map, you would have counters, you would have rules and a charts and tables booklet, and you would really be left on your own to put all the pieces together. <clears throat> now, increasingly, um, Publishers are willing to pay for ancillary player aids, cards. Um, I want to say cards. I mean, eight, eight by eleven card stock, rules, cheat sheets. Um, and as designers, when we throw our designs over to our play testers, very often the play testers will develop cheat sheets. Right, they will develop little summaries to remind them how a given mechanic works, or little graphics. And I have learned to just comb through their posts and their comments, looking for what the playtesters actually came up with, to condense and summarize um, the rules in a way that that makes it easy for them to play without constantly referring back to the rules. And so I think that. Um, that is at least one innovation that has made games, even fairly complex games. A second one is leaving aside this idea that a game is just what is in the box. That's really important because today, a modern game is not just a set of components in a box, but it is also a whole web presence of files and comments, questions and answers that are posted in things like you know, Board Game Geek and ConSim World. And then it is also a lot of video tutorials. Mo has been particularly adept at helping designers in this industry come up with a whole series of videos around their games that give context, um, examples of play, um, and then tutorials on actually how you as a player would get into the game. And so I think one of the great innovations is not thinking about the game as just the box, but in fact, an entire penumbra of artifacts that are out there in um, the web space that help support a game. Bab, Tony, you want to add anything to that? As Fabrizio seems to be answering the phone, I'll I'll dive in first. Um, I I would agree with everything that Bruce has just said, and to which I think the other one that I would add is that, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, we at TRL produce 
big games and, and complex. I'm not going to say complicated, they're complex. But therefore, there is quite a lot of work that goes in into building a step series of scenarios that allows you to learn how the game functions, both in terms of the basic rule sets, but actually then adding in the layers of complexity one on top of another until you go from having just your, you know, a very simple, I'll use the words again, you know, tank and plane slugfest in a 10 by 10k area to, you know, dominating the world or whatever it is that takes your bag when you're playing a, a commercial war game. But that whole business of stepped, linked scenarios that teach you the game and teach you the complexities without being, but by making it more playable is, I think, quite modern and quite key. And we, we wouldn't do anything without those these days, I don't think, Bob. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I basically agree because we, we produce basically monster games. And uh, as Tony said, they are, they are usually complex games. So playability by itself has never been a, 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 a first uh, uh, first target uh, for, for for us. We have uh, scenarios uh, uh, stepping up uh, the, the complexity and the, uh, the introducing the player into the game uh, up to the whole campaign with. Uh, all his assets uh, and his features. But playability is uh, usually not uh, our first uh, concern. I'm not saying that our, our, our games are not playable, of course, but uh, we, are, we are not striving for playability at, uh, at all costs. I think that uh, it's uh, actually a, a market tendency, probably the most important market tendency in the, in the recent years, because uh, the recent years, because uh, a lot of publishers are, are trying to, uh, and uh, I think that that's correct, uh, 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 try to attract more and more players by making most of their publication uh, simpler. Probably the, the, all the people uh, present today here uh, uh, at this uh, conference uh, is uh, of the uh, opposite school <laughs> because uh, our games uh, are, are not the, the, the simplest uh, on, uh, on the market uh, right now. The Mitch games, Bruce games, uh, and uh, TRL games, uh, uh, the, it's difficult to catalog them as a simple game or very playable games. We strive for reality and strive for uh, probably for complexity. That's it. Well, Mitch, before you get your portion in, these guys are talking about step learning approach, and you have something already similar in the next war series in that you have the scenarios that are the basic game because you have two sets of rules. Standard. In the base, or the standard. Sorry, the basic. <laughs> sorry, I got it wrong. <laughs> the standard game and then the advanced game, which definitely ramps things up. Right. But in the standard game, you have several scenarios to get everybody's feet wet, and then you can right. uh, go on up to the advanced game. So, Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Fab hits it the nail on the head, the games. And I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, right, the games that the three of us or four of us are putting out are not not that game, right, um, from, an, from a – innovation stand not that we're not being innovative but from a, a monster game or large complex game that's what we were that's what we're we're building you know it's an it's an interesting question because and i think fab you hit on it is that what we're seeing over the last couple of years in through the growth of the euro gaming market is a lot of those concepts are bleeding over i think into war games um where you're seeing designers abstracting out things so they'll turn it over to a play tester like bruce was saying and play testers are having trouble with whatever concept pick concept a and so the challenge now on the designer is how do i abstract that right how do i make that a little bit easier is it a card draw mechanism do we just throw the rule out do we turn that into a block instead of a counter or you know what what whatever the case may be is how do you how do you um make that easier you know in the next war series specifically the 
clearing operations mechanism came from the original crisis korea game had a totally different advanced to content or advanced to advanced to control concept which it was all table driven you had to count up steps you had to do all this work look at a table and and roll a die and it either worked or didn't well so from an abstraction standpoint put a marker down roll against that number and here are some modifiers right so it makes it much faster with almost a game within a game so those kinds of playability things i, I would say yes i think some of the larger things that we're seeing are things like, you know, I talked about it earlier, Atlantic Chase, which is from a playability standpoint, you don't put a lot of pieces down. Um, and the rules are, I don't want to say simple, very straightforward about how you manage things. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, you have a, a pretty interactive, um, not complicated game, but interesting game to play. Right. But you don't have the traditional hex counter. I'm moving. I've got Zox. I've got this. I've got that. So I think so. Yes. To answer the question, I think there are those are some examples in innovation. Well, being that we've got you, I'm going to go right back to you with this question. And you and I have already talked about this. So this would be great <laughs> for the audience here. The, uh, Timothy saying, can't remember the term for the human behavioral proficiency. Talking about efficiency rating. Efficiency. Yeah. Uh, but has the Russian conduct on Ukraine suggested mods needed in next war Poland? So go watch Whiskey Charlie from April 1st because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we didn't cover it. So, and, you know, and I'll say the same thing I did there really, you know, from my perspective, two things. One is it's a little too early. Um, mm -hmm. I think there were a lot of factors in play at the beginning that mitigate what we saw. Um, that's just my opinion right now. I think given the re, um, what do you want to call it? restaging of the conflict. Mm -hmm. I think we might see something different, um, whether it's better or not from the Russian point of view, I don't know. Um, but I think it will be telling if we do, right? Uh, in terms of the next war system, like I just said on Whiskey Charlie, you know, what you're seeing is, is uh, or what we saw at the beginning was an extended buildup scenario and the new person to war gaming was playing the Russians. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> and then we've got one from Discord, and this is going to be multi part. So, I'm going to show that in uh, sections here. Um, he's wondering how uh, he'd be interested in how different armies behave regarding command and control. This is for the C3 series. Mm -hmm. For example, in mission tactics, trained force relies on junior commanders to make decisions on the fly and simply following the commander's intent. Uh, a more rigid top-down uh, style of command that might be seen in a Soviet trained force would have less flexibility once they're encountered friction on the battlefield. Are these differences modeled in the C3 series games? Uh, yeah, yeah, they are modeled uh, more or less exactly as uh, as Tommy said. Uh, for example, uh, the, because of the, the so-called uh, mission tactics, that is the, the German uh, Afghan tactics, uh, I, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, are modeled uh, in, uh, in the C3 series. In fact, the uh, West German units uh, uh, have the possibility to change uh, their uh, deployment uh, on, on the battlefield faster than uh, the uh, units than, uh, of the, the other nations. And that's thanks to the uh, Afghan uh, statics. That's uh, something that, that uh, is uh, um, in the soul of, of the German army since the, the Prussian times. And it's something that you cannot simply export uh, to, to another army just by publishing, uh, for example, a film manual describing the, the, the Afghan tactics. It's something that... Uh, have a, it's a mental uh, behavior. It's a mental, it's a mental state uh, for uh, that, that is uh, needed to, to really apply it. And uh, on the opposite side, there, there are the, the, the Soviets. Uh, I don't know if uh, Tony want want to spend a, a couple of words in defense of Soviets. Do I want to defend the Soviets? Well, no, not, not, at, not at all. Not, <laughs> um, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I would say the following. Are there differences modeled? Very much so. Um, the first thing I would say, and it's a bit of a history lesson, but in 1985, the only people using mission command were the Germans. 
you know, the US had just decided that it might want to teach it. The UK had decided that it might want to teach it. And perhaps the first couple of lieutenants or second lieutenants were falling out of the academies who learnt it. And the odd staff officer who's falling out of, you know, the staff college might have learnt it. Bloody sure the generals hadn't done anything about it. In fact, I had one who, when given, said one piece of paper and a diagram and was told that was the divisional op order, said, where's the op order? Because what he was expecting was a stack of paper this thick that had to be delivered out. Now, the general was re-educated by his own staff over the course of his command tour. These things happen, but they weren't there. In gaming terms, what it does is allow the Germans get to react faster. Their OODA loop is quicker. They have that whole thing. They are able to change orders and states that they're in more quickly. For the others, there are some differences. NATO, the rest of NATO, if you like, then becomes the standard, you know, top-down but supported by a massive communication system that as long as it's not being jammed is very efficient and works and makes dissemination of orders easy, or easier. What, in defense of the Soviets, what the Soviets, however, have is a massive planning process at the beginning that produces an incredibly detailed plan, but actually it breaks that incredibly detailed plan down into bite-sized chunks the further and further and further you are down down the system and having got your bite-sized chunk it doesn't matter whether you can talk to the senior officer above that you know what you have to do to so do what you have to do and keep on doing it until you can't do it anymore because of casualties or whatever so yes that's exactly the point we do represent we do try and represent and we do try and understand each nation's command and control system as it existed for real in about 1985. Uh, I'll just add that uh, in the C3 system, uh, the Soviets uh, have probably more inertia uh, as a common in the common system. Uh, they, they, they are able to to give orders uh, quite fast to the big units, but uh, once that uh, the, those uh, formations start moving, uh, their inertia is uh, uh, enormous. And uh, stopping or changing them, uh, it's, uh, it's um, quite complicated. And correct me well, if I'm wrong, Fab, but uh, in the C3 series, some of that's modeled in terms of the modes that certain sides can adopt. So, for instance, NATO can do active defense, but the Soviets can't do active defense, right? And I think only NATO could do screening or, or, or screening, you know, and those kinds of things. So there are certain ways that the units can act that is only applicable to one side or other, which then has game effects, right? Correct. And so the Soviets can do uh, like close much support, better right? attacks off the line of march. So if they're in, right. in route marching, they can actually do some reasonable attacks to that. If it goes wrong, they're in stock, but if it goes right, you know, they keep on going. Um, yeah, it's very much done. It's very much done that way around. Okay, so we have another one from Jeff Beeler. He's saying, how useful would it be to apply your innovations to war games on earlier periods of history? Do those periods provide relevant experiences to modern warfare? Mitch? Uh that's a tough question. I mean, <laughs> at a basic level, sure, because you know, hex counter combat. Yes, that could that could mm -hmm. be applied. I think where some of the innovations come in is so. For instance, in the next war series, it's the sequence of play and how things interact and how you get the multi-domain warfare to be shown. Right, although you, it's a little odd because you're breaking it up into chunks as opposed to it's a continuous stream of of things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think what you might see is some of changes if you the further you go back i mean you know obviously going back to the trying to take something like next war back to rome versus carthage might not work so well because it's just it's just not how warfare was conducted right different concerns different methods and different ways of conducting that battle um strategically and tactically obviously you know at the end of the day yeah it's boots on the ground but 
but you can only take an abstraction so far, I think. True. Hmm. Tony or Fab? Mm, I would say you you need a different set of innovations. I mean, I would absolutely, I, I'd absolutely uh, agree with Mitch that we've been trying to represent, shall we say, late 20th century, 21st century warfare. It's probably the most complex it's ever been in terms <laughs> of the, the number of different elements that have to be bound in and all come together at the same time to make a plan work. And actually it's because the original hobby games were all about world war ii if we really want to be accurate about it in terms you know clank clank i'm a tank and an airplane flies over and there's a grunt digging a hole in the ground and that's pretty much about it and some guns and stuff but that's pretty much about it it's everything else that's been added since 1945 that's made it more and more and more and more complex and therefore there's had to be more and more and more innovation in order to try and keep the game playable in its <laughs> And by that, I mean it in its broadest definition, i.e. that a single person can sit down at a table across the other side of the table or across the other side of the vassal interface or whatever it is you're playing on is one other person and you can have a game. And it isn't going to take you the rest of your life to play it. You know, it's got some purpose and it will get to an end eventually. I think in the nicest possible way, the further you go back, the actual bit on the battlefield becomes easier and easier. You know, if you get straight all the way back to some sort of dark age slug fest where you just line up two sides and go bang and then start hacking with swords, there are all sorts of things, unless you want to go down to the level of the individual human interaction and trying to sort of model, uh, you know, um, morale in a different way or you know raison d'etre for fighting or you know fighting spirit and fighting will and all of that stuff but actually the rest is is pretty easy what becomes more complex if you go back where you where i think there are some innovative techniques that have been developed for the more complex modern games were if you were to take um if you were to have a game like I say Rome Total War, which is, of course, a computer game, but that sort of thing. If you've got a campaign game set in ancient or medieval times, the actual physical difficulties of getting the logistics right, if you were going to model that, will require some fairly innovative thinking, I think. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be really, really dull, you know, moving a wagon train <laughs> across Europe, at, you know, 20 miles a day, no, not even that, you know, 15 miles a day is a really dull process. You need a better thing to do than that. But the, the tactics bit, the actual fighting end, I think that's relatively easy the further back you go. And the innovation isn't required as much as it is in modern day games. Right. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's honestly that's why I touched on Volko's uh, Levian campaign series. That's what he's done. He's raised the, yeah. up the level. I'm not. He's not so worried about the actual battle. You do fight. There is combat, but it's not about the tactical engagement, right? It's about the operational pieces and yeah. a little, little bit slightly larger of the strategic of making sure you're going to have the troops you need to do what you want to do. I mean, you could in, in the GMT series, you could argue that you know, you your, your people again. Volko took the coin thing which was developed for Chile and the Andes and has then expanded back and including expanding it all the way back to do Pendragon, which is, you know, so it's a great game mm -hmm. um, and has almost zero tactics or anything to do with Dark Ages fighting, mm -hmm. but has lots to do with empire building in post-Roman, sub-Roman or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. these days, Britain. Mm -hmm. I, I just added that, that uh, I'm, I agree, mostly agree with you, but I just added for the second part of the question uh, that uh, actually I think that the, the real core of warfare has changed, uh, has changed not too much since the times of, uh, of, of the Romans. The, the real core, the, 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 the real problems, the, the core problems are all the same. So are always, uh, as, uh, and it's always been the same. Uh, logistic, uh, uh, morale of the troops, uh, 
movement, uh, uh, and so on. And so, yes, I think that uh, there, there are uh, there, uh, all the, the, the past the history of warfare is actually a relevant experience, uh, relevant uh, to, to modern warfare. And um, I think this, this, this core rules of the war will actually never change. And um, sometimes I also think that uh, actually in past war, our, uh, some past wars are much less different than we usually think uh, uh, than modern warfare. For example, the, the first thing that comes to, to my mind that uh, uh, Napoleon Grand Armée was uh, actually faster getting to Moscow uh, in uh, in 1912, in 1812, then the Germans uh, during World War II. Uh, and they, they, they went there by foot. Yeah, mostly the German too, but they, they, mm -hmm. they, had, they had mechanized forces, but uh, despite mechanized forces and everything else, uh, the, um, Napoleon was uh, actually uh, probably a little bit faster than, uh, than the German to take Moscow. And that's, uh, that's quite surprising <laughs> if, uh, if you think about that. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Well, we got one from Brent from Armchair Dragoon saying, Bruce covered some elements of friendly fog of war, but how can designers incorporate relative levels of unknown competence and friendly forces into a game? <laughs> For example, how do you ID your own phone heads? So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. You've seen me Bruce play, have you? <laughs> yeah, there have been that, several, several attempts on that, uh, that uh, in time. Uh, the, first, uh, the first example, but probably the most famous example, it's uh, Full the Gap. Uh, from uh, mm -hmm. from SPI, where the, the units uh, had uh, a, an untried status, and uh, at the first combat, uh, you just flip the unit, and you uh, reveal the, the uh, it's a true combat powers that uh, can could vary by the, uh, a large amount actually. So uh, in some way you. You ID your your bond heads when it was too late, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, uh, that's actually a, a big a big problem, yeah, for a for a printed game, uh, basically, because uh, unless you, you you prepare uh, the three or four different sets of units uh, and uh, to to draw randomly uh, every time, uh, you are more or less uh, stuck with a, with, a, with a single value. There are, of course, um, several methods to uh, make this problem uh, less, uh, less, less important. But um, anyway, I think that uh, it's quite uh, uh, not uh, it's not fixable. <laughs> yeah. well, that was the that was the there. that was the conceit of the victory in the West system, right? In Killing Ground and Overlord, where units mm -hmm. larger units were rated A, B, I think A, B, and C. Yeah. And ABC, then you and then would you pull your, a chit, and pull. if you're an A, then you're a 12, yeah. or maybe you're an 18, or maybe you're a 9. Nine's yeah. the bonehead, right? Um, I, mm -hmm. I hate polar chits. <laughs> sure, but it's a way to solve it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but there is another way to solve it, which, of course, is that you, it's all, in the end analysis, it's about squad averages. And whatever die you roll on whatever CRT gives right. you, you know, the, the guy's having a bad day, the guy's having a good day. Mm -hmm. and if the squad, if you think you've got a lot of boneheads in that in a particular army, then you know the squad average level for its competence is a little lower than the squad average level of something else. It's certainly the way it's been, the other way has been done historically, almost always. I mean, that's your classic Carter rating. You know, you know, add add seven if you're a you know member of three commando brigade. Add one if you're an alleged, you know, incompetent such and such a conscript from such and such a country without wanting to make a calumny on anybody. And, um, and and then let the randomization factor play into the CRT of, yeah. you, could, you could be the mm -hmm. best force on the planet and still roll a one. Right? Absolutely. True. Because, you know, the, somebody forgets the crypto. <laughs> <laughs> Which then you also classic, have to take into you know, account fatigue, at, too. If you look right. at first airborne division dropping into Arnhem, why can't they get any guns? Somebody forgot the, the crystals were the wrong mm -hmm. crystals for the radio. Yeah. 
You know, it's as simple as that. The guy picked up bag A instead of bag B. Mm-hmm. Bust. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then one thing I was uh, adding in, too, is you also, have to, or you can, you don't always have to, but you can also model in fatigue. Because, you know, after sustained combat operations, yep. units are going to get exhausted, uh, materials going to get wore out, and not to mention yep. supply. So that's another thing that could also change the variability of the effectiveness of the units after each battle. Yep, yep. In, uh, in C3 series in particular, there is a, uh, a heavy effect for fatigue, fatigue mm-hmm. attrition, uh, losses, uh, desertion, and... Uh, Everything else, yeah. Mm-hmm. True. Well, if there are any other questions, please post them in the chat. I don't see any others. So if we don't see one here in the next, uh, say, 60 seconds or so, we're going to wrap this up because I think we've got everybody's presentations were great. And I think we've got uh, to answer Thanks. a lot of questions. Uh, but again, I really appreciate all you taking the time today to do this. Appreciate the audience's uh, participation as well. Some great questions in there. And I hope that you found this helpful and useful. And uh, I've posted in the Discord already the locations for each of the game series that is uh, that we talked about here today. So that way, if you're not familiar with them, you can easily go out there and check out each one of them and get a little bit more information, maybe pick up a copy of them uh, when they're available. Because I know like Fabrizio and Tony, you guys uh, are going through reprints. I know Next War series is also going through the same thing. And uh, as is NATO. And uh, Aaron Armour is coming out uh, maybe the end of the year, beginning of next year, some, some, sometime around that time frame. So uh, I believe that's it. We don't have any other questions. We do have some thank yous from some people, so we'll get those in here real quick. Thank you, Treb. Appreciate it. Same to you, Timothy. Great questions. Tommy, appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, guys. Yep. And I think I, no, I think we're all on the Discord. I don't know, Fab. I, yes. I, I don't know, Tony, if you made that there. But if there's questions, well, you can there, post them in that well. channel. Yeah, put, post them in that channel. We'll have a conversation. We'll have however you want to do it. So. Absolutely. We do have that here. The dialogue can continue. Use Ooh, our I, related Discord channels there. for after broadcast interaction. And then Chris jumps in and uh, <laughs> scares everybody. Right. Yeah. So as long as you're thanking everybody, I'd like to thank all of you guys for, for, for such a great panel. Um, I've been sitting here listening to it the entire time. And it's been, it was a fantastic panel. So thank you very much for coming to, and helping, Thanks. Uh, helping make connections online a success sure, this year. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Outstanding. Well, everybody, appreciate it again. And we will catch you uh, on the next uh, in the Discord channel. And make sure that you stick around. There are plenty of more great panels coming around. And enjoy the rest of your connections experience. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.